Hey, everybody. How's it going? Uh, Jeff here. I'm joined with Justin Armand from JA Digitizing. We're both with the Embroidery Nerd. And today with the Needle Bar episode, what episode are we on, Justin? I don't know. Eight, I do believe. I just showed nine fingers because I'm awesome. Um, so today we will be talking a little bit about DST files. Um, I've actually had a few questions uh, recently asking me, how can I take a DST file and turn it into a native object? Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about DST files, the limitations of DST files and um, that as well. But before we get too far in it, we'll go ahead and do some announcements. Uh, we are all excited, super excited for uh, Fort Worth coming up. Um, I had a notification that maybe in like four days, I might be getting something that may be going with me to Fort Worth. And, you know, I'm horrible at saying maybe, but it, it, it's true. Um, and uh, coming up this Saturday, uh, 1.30 Central Standard Time, Center of the Universe, as I've heard it called before, uh, we will be hosting um, Lee Caracelli's second video on color blending, or the second webinar on color blending. And I'll go ahead and drop a link to that in the comments there. And let's bring up a few of our watchers we've got here. We've got Eric Campbell from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hello, the one and only Eric. We've got Letty, the shop in Mansfield, Ohio. The way you said the shop in Mansfield, Ohio, that makes me think that you've got more than one location. <laughs> uh, we have Carol here. Hello, Carol. And I think Eric's, yep. I'm excited for Fort Worth, uh, Letty. Yeah, we're all excited. And Carol says there's an echo in the audio. I'll push down my little volume button and throw popcorn at Justin to make that go away. It's probably me, my bad speaker that I had to use. <laughs> we might have had, definitely had, a little bit of technical difficulty getting on. And so we are approximately, I think we said four minutes late. And there we go. So... Uh, Letty says, make sure you sign up for panelist discussion. And we have Sedona here from Leesburg, Florida. So I'm going to try and make sure that I sign up for panelist discussion because I would like to go to that. Um, isn't, isn't that what you're featured on? Maybe. <laughs> I, I, I think I should sign up for it so they'll let me into it. Um, <laughs> they might not let me into it if I don't sign up. I don't know. I've never been to uh, Impressions Expo before. Have you, Justin? Uh, the ISS um, Long Beach several years ago. Several years ago? Like long time ago. <laughs> like, like, you know, it's funny because I, I look at everything now and I think, okay, well, it was last year. But really, like... I haven't gone anywhere for a year. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't feel like it's been a year yet, but it's, you know, I have to add a year on to everything that I'm explaining just because we haven't gone anywhere in a year. Yep. Oh, all the horrible woes. So um, I've gotten a few questions this week and I don't know if you have Justin, but a lot of times um, I have people, they come to me and I'll send them a DST file and they have, uh, different, uh, different software than what I have. So they don't get the native software or the native format and they want to pull the DST into their software and quickly and easily convert it to a native object. And as far as I'm aware, and Justin, you can throw something at me if I'm wrong, there's not really a super easy way to do that. You're going to spend a little bit of time editing a DST file to turn it into a native object. And by that I mean you're probably going to redigitize the whole thing. Or right. if you're not redigitizing the whole thing, it's going to take you probably twice as long as actually just digitizing it again, in my opinion. Right. I mean, there's there's times where, I mean, you you may even get from a digitizer that they they can they can uh, supply an EMB file. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's created in Wilcom. Uh, just like in artwork programs, I, I can send somebody an Illustrator file and all it is is an embedded JPEG and there's no vector to it at all. Uh, kind of same thing with, with DST files, DST being the, the most generic file that the majority of software and machines can read. It's going to be just the generic one that's passed around the most. And yes, I can take a, a DST file into to my wings into into Wilcom into Chroma, whatever software it might be, 
and and save it in that native format as far as the extension to the file but that doesn't mean that it's creative created as a native file in that particular software so that's one thing you got to be careful of as far as you know not knowing what type of file you're getting if someone's supplying it to you yep so i'm gonna grab a few comments here because we're getting a couple in and letty says sometimes i join from the living room gotcha uh eric i think jeff and i will certainly be signed up i hope so taught at impressions for a while i personally bring you to the speaker's lounge i'm excited there's a lounge i gotta go to a lounge i don't know it's like the it's like the delta club i gotta go in there and <laughs> maybe free drinks we'll see uh we've got fred so how do i design a few graphics with the idea of combining them later so combining dst files is um it's different, I think, in every software how you do it. Uh, I think the biggest thing that you're gonna you're gonna want to keep in mind when you're designing several pieces of artwork and with and you're planning on bringing them all in together later is you want to make sure that the sound or not the sound throw something at me, Justin. <laughs> the size. So if you're planning on bringing a whole bunch of things together, you're digitizing them all separate. You want to bring them all together. The biggest thing is, is that you want to make sure that you're designing each piece of artwork in relative size to each other so that when you actually bring them all together, you're not having to resize and scale and shift. You know, it's already at the same relative size. So you're just mainly um, combining, I guess, would be my thought on that. Justin, yours? Right. Yeah, it's definitely, especially when uh, when you're dealing with, you know, designing different elements to put together later can make it, it can mean a whole different a whole lot of things you know de designing text that you're gonna you know just drop over a football or over a baseball so it's over different you know like a school name over different sports and stuff like that you can pretty much gauge that you know you want your icon to be around two inches and your text a certain height so it's just a matter of moving them around in your software uh but if if you are uh creating the the designs as far as just artwork and then later on digitizing in your native uh software it's it's a lot easier to manipulate sizes and whatnot as you're creating them if you have dst files that you're working with and you want to bring in uh those files together that's where it gets a little bit more sticky depending on what software you have because there is certain softwares that don't have what's called um stitch processors so that means that if you scale that that DST file within the software itself, it may or may not uh, adjust the stitches in that file. So if, if your software doesn't have a stitch processor and at three inches something has 10,000 stitches and you scale it down to, to two inches, it's going to try to jam that same 10,000 stitches into that file because it didn't process the stitches and, and reduce it by reducing the size. So. Uh, the software definitely has uh, something to do with it. And as far as like planning ahead, what you're putting it on, size that you're putting it on and, and whatnot. So I'm going to grab a couple comments here. Uh, Fred says, so in short, combining graphics is, well, forget about it. Um, <laughs> it all depends. Like it, it's such a subjective answer because without looking at it, it's really, really hard to guess whether or not it's going to be an actual like it'll fit really well together it'll go together really well together or if it's you know this is going to overlap that now i have to deal with what layer is going to be on top where this is going to be where that's going to be so right. it's really really subjective just like bringing in dst files into software it can it can become very very subjective to what the software is thinking and Eric actually says here, even if you use object processing, it's not like you get back native objects. You get a best guess according to the logic in the software, and it's often less than stellar. So one of the things that I see a lot when people bring that stuff in is that like if you have a fill and your start and stop points are not directly at the ends from the start of the fill and the end of the fill, the software is going to read that and it's going to see the start and stop points and it's going to treat it as two separate fills. Right. And they overlap just a little bit, but you know now your underlay is all going to come in as a separate object because I've never seen a um, an object recognition actually say, okay, this is a center run underlay and this is a zigzag 
underlay, it just goes, okay, this is a run stitch, this is a zigzag stitch, and this is a satin object. And so now right. you've got three separate objects. And oftentimes when somebody sends me a file and they say, here's a native file in the native format, and I pull it in and I look off to the side and I can see manual stitches on tie-ins and tie-outs, I can see run stitches as underlay, and then the objects on top, I, I know that they sent me a DST file that was brought into the software and it was read about, read right. from there. So it really, really, you know, it's, it's very easily identifiable um, if you know what you're looking for. And then once you know, okay, this is all, this is all what it is, you can look and um, I, I tend to treat it, if it's brought in by objects, it's processed by objects, I look at the objects and if they're good objects, which is eh, sometimes, then I'll rip out all the stitching underneath the run stitch underlays and I'll start setting in my own um, lock stitches. I'll start setting in my own underlay on the object itself so that it's no longer separate objects, which gives me the ability to scale and it's going to scale the upper stitching as well as adjust the underlay underneath. And that's really right. where it comes into having a stitch processor like Justin was talking about. Right. Yeah. You're, you're kind of just using the, the the core skeleton of everything the outline of the main part and then just adjusting all the 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 underlay and stuff even even if you have like a, a large fill area that you see that's broken up really weird when you scale it there's a gap between the two sections or something like that um even just deleting that whole fill and and just adding your own fill in your native software and you know digitizing the fill over and everything else that you could utilize uh, another another telltale sign that uh, you have a DST file that's not in your native software is uh, if you if you go into node editing, a lot of times you'll see a ton more nodes that don't need to be there, and you know that someone didn't digitize a square that normally has maybe eight points, two points at each corner, but in between there's thirty different nodes that are all you know jaggedy or or not even and stuff like that. You know, in in the stitch processing. For whatever reason that software kind of read it as oh well this is an object that has 30 different nodes in it and it's not very even um sometimes it's, it's not so bad that if you saw it out it would even you would even notice it but trying to analyze and trying to get into something that you need to edit that's that's, that's something you that you run into from time to time when opening a dst file yep and so i'm going to bring in a comment here i was taught that you can resize dst files 10 percent up or down more than that, we would need to digitize the logo. Is that right? I've been learning. I was taught many things wrong lately. So um, I'm going to take a stab at this one, and then I'll let you take a stab at it, Justin. Uh, and I'll bring it back up here so it's still up here. So sort of. Um, if you're resizing it on the machine where there's no stitch processor, I would not go more than 10% up or down. Um, if you go 10% up, you're likely going to have a little bit of gapping in there. You're going to, it's just going to look a little light on the density. If you go down, it's going to look a little more dense. You, you're, that's kind of where that rule of thumb is, uh, came from is being able to scale it on the machine. Now, if you bring it into your software, depending on how the software read it into objects, you may or may not be able to scale it up more than that. Ultimately, the best test is to bring it into your software, scale it export it and then do a test so out to see how it did and if it didn't do what you expected it to do then likely it's going to need to be digitized one thing that you should always be aware of is when you get something digitized by a digitizer a lot of times they'll just resize it for you for free you send them hey i need this an inch bigger and they'll rescale it and send you the thing whether or not that becomes a paid edit depends on how much work goes into changing it after scaling and I'm going to let you take a stab at that one, Justin. Uh, I think it has to do with a lot to do with the with the digitizing itself um, or the design itself too. If it is something that you've digitized in your native uh, file type in your software, or your digitizer is giving it to you in the same software that you have, um, there might be times where it's not necessarily going to distort or affect the the design in, in scaling it necessarily. But say like something has detail that, you know, if I were the digitizer, I opted to do running stitch detail on say someone's face, but that 10 or 15% bigger now puts it over the edge of, of the size where I could have done satin stitch borders instead of 
uh, running stitch borders. So now it may just look better if it's redone at that other size in different stitch types. Or texts say that you're you got a text that the the width of the of the satins on your text are just borderline, you know, kissing that area that they're too wide, and you opt to do a satin stitch with some extra density or some extra uh, underlay. But scaling up that ten to fifteen percent, you should really go to a fill stitch at that point. So those are the those are the other things you need to worry about as far as just grabbing a file and scaling it up. That's why a lot of times going from a left chest or a hat to a jacket back is not going to work because there's actually stitch types that should be changed or redigitized in those uh, instances. Yep. And Eric here says manually engraving style detail and shading that has a really narrow window for scale. So those are all things that just it all plays into an, an, an equation, basically. There are some designs that you I could look at. You know, if I had a fill with a just like a fill collegiate letter with a four millimeter wide border, satin border going around it, I know that I'm going to be able to scale that roughly down till that border goes to a millimeter. And then I could scale it till that border goes to probably seven millimeters before I'd start going, you know what, I need to adjust more things. Um, so it, it all kind of plays into the file that you're looking at. And I pulled up a file here actually in my software. This is a DST file that I sewed out recently. And I actually had to go into my software and I had to tell it to read it as objects because when I open files in my software, especially DST files or machine files, I don't like the machine to try and determine whether or not it's objects. I like it to just bring in the stitches so that it doesn't really process the, the stitches after the fact and cause issues. Um, and if we take a look over here in our object sequence list, you can see if I can, let's see if I can move it. We may or may not be able to move it separately. We'll find out. So you can see that is my zigzag underlay. It broke it up into two objects here, a third object there. Let's grab all three of those and move them up. So that didn't work, Justin. You should have told me that that wasn't going to work. <laughs> all right. So we'll grab those three objects and we'll pull those up. So that is my zigzag under the, it looks like it may have recognized that there was, well, probably not because there's my center run underlay. So it looked it looks like it didn't recognize fully that that there was a run stitch. It caught that traveling stitch right there, and it says, okay, that's part of the manual stitch that I'm putting down. It picked up that I had a center run underlay, and, of course, actually it didn't. So here is my center run underlay, and I had a zigzag underlay. So let's see how many more of these are going to come out. Oh, that's an edge run. There you go. So now I've got all of these objects here that are that were separated out that were originally part of one it was all one singular object that got separated into i'm not even going to count how many that was that seems like a lot more than you would expect and there's even more in here as we go through to pick all these out and so if i the first thing i would do is if i was trying to turn this into a native object is here is an object outline it recognizes an object you can see off to the right you can see these are manual stitches, so likely these are either short stitches or they're lock stitches, and these are run stitches, and this, that whole thing, it picked it up as manual stitches. But if I wanted this to be a native file, the very first thing I would do is I'd start coming in here, and I'd be deleting all of these manual pieces. There's another one, there's another one, until I'm left with just the regular objects. And now I'm facing a unique, another problem is these are all, they're still split, as you can see there. But now all of the commands that I would normally have, like lock stitch here, tie in here, this is where I want you to start. I have to go in and I have to put those, um, I have to put those commands back in so that I don't get this really long jump stitch from there to there. And that it actually travels the way I want it to. And really... If you can see the object, and that, there we brought up the stitches. There is no lock stitch anymore. I deleted that. So I have to go in there, and I have to make sure that my connectors, my tie-in is tying in. So now I'm tying in. And this one here, I have to make sure that I have my tie-in. 
So we'll turn that. And then in my tie off, I need to make sure that it ties off before trim and that I'm turning the trim on. So I'm going to hit if connectors below four millimeters, roughly, it still left it there. So you can see that this is now becoming a little bit more, it's becoming a lot more labor intensive. And I'm going to have to start going in there and really digging around and changing the settings and all of that stuff where if I just sat down and I re-digitized this, I could digitize that pretty quickly and that pretty quickly. And now I've got an actual native object versus trying to go in here and spend more time editing than it would be if I just sat down and digitized it initially. Right. So Eric says here, object processing stripes, stripes again. Absolutely. And Sedona says, mostly it's our decodable collect, Dakota collectible designs that we have the rule for. They, if it never fails, they pick as an inch and a half design and want it on a back jacket. Yeah. So yeah. it's, if, if you've got a one inch design, you're going to throw it on the back of the jacket. I can already tell you without opening it, opening it in software, it's probably going to need to be redigitized. And you're going to need to talk to Dakota Collectibles about that because they probably have a copyright. I mean, they do have a copyright on their work. And whether or not editing that file to change it is a violation of their terms of service is another thing that you're going to have to look into. And it's best just to contact them directly for that information. So I talked a lot, Justin, your turn. <laughs> Um, yeah, as far as like the stock designs that you get online, like Dakota collectibles and stuff, you got to remember those are digitized for the particular size that they're giving you. Um, there, I know there's some newer places now that when they put out designs, they might give you three or four different choices as far as something from a two inch to a three inch to a four inch and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's, that's a nice option to have when you're buying stock designs, but yeah, that, that 10% rule on stock designs like that, I would say you'd be safe within that 10%. I wouldn't try to go any larger than that. Cause I think that's when you start running into kind of the distortion of the file or, and, or the, the, the need for a, a different digitizing style for certain stitches, you know, satins to fills or, or whatnot. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there is times where if it, if it truly is the, the solution that you're trying to get to is creating a native file for your software. I personally think the best bet is to redigitize it because editing your, yeah, you're, you're, you can edit the, the things out. Like you showed like the, the underlay and, and, and manipulating, uh, nodes and stuff like that. But to get a truly scalable native file that's not going to have any issues that you have with with uh, working with DST files, you're going to have to redigitize it, in my opinion. Um, but as far as working with DST files like this, there there is tricks that you can do to to kind of maybe speed up the process. Like for instance, I'm going to share my screen here, Jeff. Yep. And I will remove mine. So I'm going to grab another comment here. And Carol says, is it best not to use the manual stitch option and just use the open run stitch? So I can tell you that when I use the manual stitch option, it's generally when I'm moving between texts and I really want to bury two short stitches right next to each other as I'm traveling between letters. Otherwise, I personally feel it's better to use the open run stitch. Yeah. And Fred says, what company has the lowest price for made in the USC t-shirts? Um, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> so let's pull up Justin's screen here. We'll add it to stream. And there you go. Okay. So for instance, something like Jeff was just going through and especially when you have, uh, okay, say you get this file from a customer either you know gives you an old file of theirs or or you may have purchased the company and you have a huge library of, of files that may not be the best as far as digitizing um one of the things is you know sometimes you find lettering that you maybe even want to scale down just a bit or lettering that they just hammered the underlay in they just have 
double zigzags, outline or you know edge walk, and you know five passes of underlay that are ne not necessary, or the particular garment that you're working with, it's it's really hammering it into. Um, so that's a, one of the reasons why you might go through like Jeff was doing and pull out the underlay and repath and reset your settings on the kind of strip it down to just that satin stitch underlay so one thing that i do uh as far as as a as a quick tool to to get rid of all the underlay or all the running stitch or manual stitches underneath this text is in wilcom i'll actually go to uh, select by stitch type and I'm going to select the satin stitch. So it's going to basically select my, my core pieces that I want to keep. And I'll actually just go to the position and knock it down maybe 20 millimeters. So now it basically took all the satin stitches that I want, moved it down so I can just go ahead and grab all those running stitches I don't want, grab them, delete them, move them back to the position where I was. And now it's just a matter of going through and uh, repathing and, and setting my settings as far as the, the underlay that I do want. But that's just a, a, a quick way of kind of going through, grabbing everything at once, deleting it. And then that, it gives you that, that shell of those satin stitches that you can go ahead and start editing the way you need to edit. You know, adding some column width or... or uh, you know, like on this thin lettering, I would just grab it and add a running uh, center stitch underlay or whatever it is that you wanted that that, that you're trying to, to manipulate the DST to. Yep. And to like, it, again, it depends on the type of um, file you're doing. Justin's here. His example is I would totally turn that into a native object. It It's um, basically very flat, straight satins that work really well. Um, so that is something that I would, ta I would actually tackle. It is important that when you're putting in your settings that you're making sure that you get the lock stitches in there, um, so right. that you can get that taken care of. And, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull up cause we have the other Campbell in the building. So we've got both Campbell's. It's officially a party. Um, but there are lots of examples, mm -hmm. uh, that we can go through. It's really important though, that when you do decide that you're going to tackle this, that you kind of understand what you're looking at and that you can um, make sure that you're applying the correct settings. Uh, one thing that I always like to really hammer is tie in stitches and tie out stitches uh, because that beginning lock stitch, if you don't put it in there as your machine runs, it'll actually pull the thread out of the needle as it starts and right. then not tying off. Now you're, stitches are going to become unraveled after a trim as it continues to move on. So it becomes very important, uh, particularly when you're converting DST files that you go back in there and you make sure that you get those settings. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And it, it may, and it may be where, you know, if you are a shop that does allow people to supply their own DST, maybe they're coming from, from a shop that they didn't like their customer service or they're coming from a shop that closed down or they move states and they they're you know they have the wherewithal the to to grab their DST file from the local embroiderer there. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll grab it and in 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 my shop if someone if someone gives us a file, I, I kind of run through it and, and look at it on screen and I could pretty much identify if there's anything going to be you know any problem areas that are jumping out at me that I need to fix before I put it into production, but. There's also times where it may be, like you said, it may be one tie-in stitch out of the whole design that is just driving your operator crazy because every single time that comes up in that design, it's it's going to pull out the thread and it's going to register as a thread break. Um, so that's something I tell my operators that if it's if it's something in the design that they're dealing with that's at the same point of the design every run, that is a flaw in the in the file. That's where, you know, let me know. I'll go into the file, adjust it, make the adjustments so the production on it's a lot more efficient. Um, you know, there's other problems they run into if it's all over the place and different heads and different needles and all that. Typically, when it's sporadic like that, it's not going to be the file. But something like that where it's like, oh, before this G, every single time it pulls the thread out and I get a thread break. 
okay, then I know that there's not a sufficient tie in stitches on that G. I'm going to go in there, adjust that. Even if you're just throwing a couple of, of manual stitches, extra manual stitches in there to get that to tie in and it's not going to pull out every single time. I decided I was going to bring up a filled example and I brought up probably the worst filled example I could because it worked fairly well. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to bring up my screen here. So here I have a patch. Um, and if we look at the different fills that it broke in here, I don't know, Justin, I like to separate everything out if I can and bring it into different pieces because then I can look at it. And this is actually, um, I use the fill techniques that Lee teaches in her classes on this one. Um, and I manually did, I actually manually did my underlay and I put it in between layers. <laughs> so that was another trick I was trying to work with. But as we move everything apart here, these fills literally started from one end and went all the way to the other. Um, had they not, it would have done something more like what this zigzag stitch did here. As you can see, it broke it up into two, um, two different pieces because it traveled one direction and then stopped and traveled another direction. Now I'm just going to pull all, everything apart because I really could have picked a better example, Justin, I promise. So here I have, again, another piece of underlay and an actual travel stitch, and it broke it up into a couple different things. But I'm going to crack my knuckles, and I'm going to pull up a couple comments. We have Jerry Lee from Coeur d'Alene. Hello, Jerry Lee. We have Titan Benjamin here. Uh, how to make a full circle complex fill. Mine will go oval. Um when you're working in your software, a lot of times it will go oval. Um, especially if I if I did this and I just did a complex fill like that, when that stitch is out, it's going to be an oval because of the way the stitches pull in. So to actually get a circle, I'd need to digitize something like that. And now as those stitches pull in, I'm actually going to end up with an oval. So it's kind of working with the distortion that you know is going to happen uh to get to get your end result and you can actually measure like sew out a circle and measure the distortion and, and apply that to your settings um what is your preferred pattern patterns of manual tie stitch especially ties in the middle of satin i can't always leave it to software justin i if i'm going to manually do it i typically kind of and again this the area that you have makes a difference as well. But I typically will do just a couple of stitches in a line and then kind of double back over itself and almost make like a like a star over itself. Yep. And, and you can see here in my software, if we move, because I still have it up, Justin, so I win. Uh, a lot of times in the software, it'll actually do a triangle. So it'll do like there, 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 and there. And then it'll take off. So... Um, it is like sewing though. You can do two short stitch or three short short stitches and then double back on itself. Right. Um, I know when I tie out, I like to do that kind of method there because if you do the um, if you do this on a tie out, that might grab the satin stitch next to it and actually pull it over a little bit. Right. So when it comes down to tie ins and tie outs, if it's in the middle and I don't have to worry about it, I'll do kind of a star like Justin does. If it's uh, on a finishing stitch, I want to make sure that I'm uh, not putting something there that's going to be visible that I don't want to be visible. So I hope that answers your question. And I can see, Justin, you have more pulled up here that you wanted to... Well, the, the fill that you were trying to grab, I have one that's uh, a, an example. Like these these two sections in here, I moved it. The underlay has its own area, but the underlay there. But if I grab this fill... I can see that because of the of the angle that it's at, it has these little sections that it did. It probably walked over over to here. It has this large section, these two smaller sections, and this one. So uh, dealing with you know the DST, it's going to break it up all in the sections and even the green. I can see that the the green is is broken into several sections depending on on the way the the software broke it up to to get to where it's going. So a lot of times where say this DST file is, is just not too doing too well, where, where those two fills meet, because there's not enough 
overlapping stitches, a lot of times you can identify that by uh, by going into the DSC file and see that's where the file had been broken up. And it's just a matter of maybe just grabbing some nodes and overlapping one section over the other. And that's going to solve your problem with any gapage that you get in that fill. Uh, but these are the weird things that, that you kind of see in DST files. The DST file is not, not a perfect file, I would say. Um, it's kind of more of just the raw information of, of where stitches are. Uh, I've, I've actually seen, and, and I don't know if there's any technical reason for this or not. Matt may know with all his zeros and ones. Uh, <laughs> and extra zeros. Uh, but saving a DST over and over in different softwares it's almost like playing telephone that by the 20th time that design can be so awful and even though it may have been digitized correctly and, and pretty well in the, from the get-go <coughs> there's just something that happens in the information as it gets saved over and saved over and in in different softwares you know creating that dst file um so I can answer a little bit of that. So every time you export a file, um, what we look at on the screen here uh, is a render of what the stitches will actually be. It's not where the actual stitches will go. So when you save the file out, it runs it through a stitch processor as well as a stitch filter. And the stitch filter can have various settings put on there for like how short your shortest stitch can be. And um, the short stitch, the lock stitches can actually be filtered out. So if I opened Justin's file in my software and saved it as a DST again, it could actually filter out the, um, the lock stitches. Another right. instance where that may occur is some software does not recognize variable stitch lengths as it goes into an underlay. Um, particularly when you go around like a B in Wilcom, it'll actually shorten up the run stitches as it moves around. So if you go into a software that doesn't recognize that when you open the DST, it's actually going to take it and it's going to say that's a run stitch and it's going to apply an even stitch length along all of those points. And now instead of having long stitch, short, 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 now you just have long, 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 long. And then again, as you save it, so it, it changed the object as you imported it. And as you save it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to run it again through a stitch filter and it can even take out more stitches. So every time you bring in a machine file into a piece of software and you export it out again, you're just basically, you're stripping out stitches, you're putting in other stitches, and it's no longer what the digitizer intended it to be. Right. And now you've just got a whole bunch of, problem so and um, somehow i mean even even in the in this the stitch uh category of it of filtering out stitches or changing stitch lengths but even like i've had it where say like you grab this text that's sh that's showing and and you scale it up five percent for whatever reason the information that 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 it's that it's retaining as far as the the nodes of the outlines of that satin stitch there's times where i've seen uh, an, an E, say the middle of the E, completely close up. Like just just scaling it up now takes those nodes, and instead of it being you know even nodes are all the way around that that satin, now it just move three nodes further in, and then it's completely distorted the satin stitch. So stuff like that you really need to pay attention to if you are manipulating DST files, especially if it's something that that you didn't create from the get go in your software. So we always have to remember that what we do is dimensional. So when the software pulls it in, it looks at it like a vector graphic would look at layers in a graphic. So if I'm, I'm going to pull up my software here, I change to a different software. So if I grab these, the inner stitching there, that's what it's seeing is one layer. And then right. it's seeing another layer here. And then the final layer it's seeing as the cover stitches on top. So it's trying to read it like it's layers rather than a singular object, which is what it would be if we created it in the software. We'd be assigning these, you know, you'd be telling it, okay, the first layer is going to be a center run. The second layer is going to be a zigzag. 
And the third layer is going to be a cover stitch. And I want this to all to be one object mm -hmm. where the software is going to recognize it. It's going to go, okay, well, the very first layer I see is a run stitch. And then I see this. So this must all be on one layer. And now I see this. So this must be another layer. And so it's trying to just guess at right. what you've done based off of the best guess that it can do. But this is one reason why I don't think that digitizers, embroidery digitizers will ever be a fully automatic process. It's always going to take somebody to interpret it. And that's because we need to be able to tell the software these are objects. And I don't see software being able to go, you know what? This should be all of these objects or this, the, all these settings should be on this object. Or I see this, I need to add a little more pull compensation. I don't ever see software pulling getting there. And so I, I see the software making it quicker and easy for people who digitize to actually lay down the stitches and get it the way they want. But I don't ever see it, um, digitizers or manual digitizing going away. Hope not. <laughs> Hope not. Fingers crossed. Uh, one other thing too, to, to keep in mind, um, you know, if someone brings a DST file to you and, and say like, there's, there's text involved in it, like that basil, uh, something to keep in mind, if, unless it's something where it's such a standard font that you already have that font in your software. Um, and, but if someone brings you a file and says, well, yeah, that's someone's name. And I want you to duplicate that font. And I think people think computer oh, you can just grab a word, type a different name, and you can continue on with that font. So if it's a DST file, you're not going to be able to, to treat it as a font where you can just click on it, change your, your verbiage, your name, whatever the lettering, whatever it is. Um, if it's not a font that you have in your software, that is going to be something where you're going to have to manually digitize every single name if they want to stick to that font or if you can find that font out there that you can purchase that's native to your software. Um, but those are things to keep in mind where if someone is supplying a DST file and they want to match a font, uh, you're, you're going to have to explore if it's something that you have something close, if you do have it in your software, or if it's something that they're going to want to pay for digitizing for every single word or every single name that they do to match what's in the file. So that's another drawback of, of DST files. If you are trying to grab it, and, and just do a bunch of names off the same font. It's not, that's not something you're gonna be able to do from a DST font. Yep, and you know, when you take a DST font, you take a stitch render and you take a picture of it and you put it in what the font or font squirrel or whatever, it's gonna freak out when it sees all of the render of the thread. It's not gonna be able to go, you know what, that's an R or that's this font. It's trying to interpret something that's completely different than what it's ever seen before. And so um, when I do that, I actually go in and I redraw the font in a vector file. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I trace the stitches in, in my vector software. And then I take a picture of that and move it in so that you can see that. If you, if you take a word and if you hammer the heaviest density you possibly can and change it to black, sometimes you can output that and it'll look like a solid object for those, for those font finders. Uh, I've done that and it has worked. So that's just one thing you could try. I would think right click convert to vector. <laughs> Maybe you get lucky with it if it's if it Maybe. If yeah. it outlined it the way that it's supposed to. Right. Um I I do know a few companies that they've created their own fonts that go with their logo and they use it on their own their name tags. And it's not one that you can just take a picture of and go, oh, I really like this font. Let me put it out here. Um, like I, I know yearbook fonts are another thing. They are actually licensed to, uh, I forget the company's name that makes the yearbooks, but they actually create their own fonts. And the only way to get those fonts is to order a yearbook through them with that. Oh, wow. So, uh, I, I, I ran into that because I had a request and somebody brought me a yearbook and they were like, I want this font. <laughs> yeah. It turned into a whole big thing. Um, so Let's grab a couple of comments here. Eric says that often there are filters in the final output that cause issues. Yeah, and it just, it turns into every time you open and save and open and save, or open and export, I guess, open and export and open and export. Every time you do that, it's just sitting there, stripping out stitches, adding stitches, changing things, and it, it can turn into a hot mess real quick. Right. Um, we've got... 
Eddie here, watching from Michigan. Hello. And that company, Jostens. Jostens, yeah. Yep. So they create their own uh, fonts that are used in their yearbooks. And I found that very, very interesting when I was trying to find a font. I was like, okay, great. It's in a yearbook. What font is it? And it didn't match anything out there. So, yeah. A lot of times, a lot of times if you're close, it's, it's, it's going to be fine. Especially if they have, you know, one word in their design. And that's giving you, you know, five letters of that particular font. They're not going to know what that capital S looks like, you know, possibly in that font. So if you pick something that, that's remotely close and, on, and all the rest of the words aren't using the same five letters that they're seeing in their logo, it'll work. So it turns into that consistency thing, but it, right. it all depends on who your customer is. How important is it that it matches exactly? Um, because a and lot they, of times, anytime somebody sends me their artwork, I say, well, hold that thought. We might have to change it just a little bit. Right. And if they come back and they say, absolutely not, then I'm like, oh boy, this is going to be a fun day. And a lot of times it's a matter of if they want to pay the setup fee, you know, yep. if someone comes off and they're just like, oh, I have this towel and I want this name and I really like this font. It's like, okay, you can choose from a large library of stock fonts we have. Or if you want that one, it's going to be X amount to digitize. And they're like, yeah, I'll take, I'll take that stock font. Yeah. I've got a family reunion coming up. I need this on a hat. Right. All right. Here's my list of fonts that I have. Right. They come in and they say, it needs to be this font and it's got to be on every hat. Well, now you're going to be paying for digitizing. Uh, so where's your free font list? <laughs> That's yeah. usually how that conversation goes. Right. Right. Exactly. Results may vary. Um I do see a question here. So Christian asked, how does a presser foot work? The presser foot basically comes down and it holds the material down while the needle goes through the material. Other than that, it's magic and a lot of machine stuff, but mostly <laughs> magic. So hopefully that gives you guys um, a little bit of basis on DST files when you're bringing them in, when you're resizing them. You know, you can, you can resize on a machine, but ultimately... If you only have one of an item to do your final sew out on, it's not the time to resize and hope it works. You always want to make sure that you do a test stitch. If you do any resizing, test it out. You know, the 20 minutes or whatever and 50 cents in stabilizer and 8 cents in fabric. If it can save you from having to replace a $70 shirt, might be worth it. Anytime you put anything on the machine and you have to do this when you're doing it, it's probably not a good idea. Yeah, unless if it's your first time ever doing that technique. Because I know the very first time I put foam on a machine, I was like yeah. <laughs> holding it down, trying to make sure that the thing didn't blow up. But right, if, if you're questioning the design before you put it on what you're putting it on, you should probably test it just to make sure. Right. That comes from Justin, his official <laughs> official stamp, official company rec recommendation right there. So, um, but hopefully that gives you guys an idea, at least when you're working with DST files. Sometimes it's just simpler to have it redigitized um, if you can. Again, you need to watch out for copyright in terms of service. If it's a stock design versus if it's like a company logo that the company brought you and said, I need my logo done. You know, it, it, it can turn into a mess. So just make sure that when you do go to get something redigitized, that you have the proper authorization to do that. Right. So that's my long story on that. I'm not, gonna <laughs> it's a long story, Justin, but um, Eric here says, I will sign on for that. Justin and Eric, when you are looking to blame someone for testing time, that's who I blame. Justin. <laughs> then Eric. Then Justin again. Then Eric. Maybe Matt. <laughs> it, it all depends. Blame it all on me. Yep. That's why we keep him around. <laughs> we need the scapegoat. Yep. He can throw something at us. But, uh, yeah, hopefully that helps you guys out. Um, that's pretty much all we had prepared. Uh, I'll, I'll go through announcements again. We have Fort Worth coming up. The applique getaway just uh, ended. 
I heard it was a great time and I hear that they may be uh, selling the virtual classes again, the access to the recording. So keep an eye out for that coming up this Saturday. So today, okay, this Saturday, July 31st, 2021. <laughs> we'll put that for people watching the recording. Uh, we're hosting the uh, second webinar in blending and shading and color for Lee Caroselli. So I'm really excited for that because as she was sending me the class descriptions, I was like, there's a difference. <laughs> so I'm really excited for her classes coming up. Uh, if you guys want to sign up for that, it is embnerd.com forward slash blend two. We have that here in the, uh, in the comments further up as well. Um, ISS Fort Worth is coming up. We're excited for that as well. Uh, and I'm trying to think of anything else. Oh, if you are signed up for the webinar, there may or may not be a random drawing to get some nerd stars. So I might be sending some of those out. If you want a nerd star, there's a limited opportunity to get some. <laughs> Justin, do you have any announcements? No, I think you covered it. Awesome. So with that, guys, I'm Jeff Fuller with Fuller Embroidery Works and the Embroidery Nerd. And that is Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios and the Embroidery Nerd, and we will look forward to seeing you guys next time.